Okay, hello everyone, and welcome to the pod, Cube Pod 23. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante. It's uh, Friday. We're recording this uh, in California and in Boston, Massachusetts area. Dave, great to see you. Big, big week, you know, in in the news. Um, Elon's uh, uh, is still in the news, X'd out, going after you know anti hate speech organization over baseless claims. Still going on the saga of Twitter. A lot of debate there. But the big story this week, obviously, is um, the continuing of the in-studio events in our in our office. So uh, excellent work there. But earnings, AWS still doing well. Amazon had their earnings. This is uh, Andy Jassy's second year at the helm, and so you're seeing his his uh, fingerprints are starting to get on things. He's cutting like the to the bone in some areas, killing projects. The numbers came out great. I want to get your opinion. I know you've been all over it and got the exact number right, by the way. Congratulations. Apple earnings are out. They're down on revenue. Uh, new iPhone 15 expected to come out. Um, just a lot, a lot of great stuff, you know, I mean, with 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 this so-called tailwind in AI and these other headwinds. Apparently, the Amazon announcement um, talked about the fact that the cost optimization or right sizing is slowing down while new workloads are are, are coming online. I don't know that he's they're talking about new workloads being generative ai since they mentioned it in every other sentence in the in the announcement but great <laughs> results by aws uh, amd strong progress on their ai chips uh, nvidia doing well cyber roundup microsoft still licking their wounds from some some bad results there but you know overall the cloud players doing well and i think it just overall just great kind of signaling arista networks jumped huge uh, jay shree and the team they're doing great so, so some signals, Dave, that the soft landing is here. Obviously, with the Amazon earnings, the, their stock's up, and Amazon numbers still twelve percent good, lowest they've had since reporting. But remember, that's twelve percent growth on a bigger number every time. So, um, how you doing? <laughs> What's the, you, you've been yeah, in the weeds on so, this. Oh my God! Well, so first of all, I feel like I, I I was in Palo Alto for a month, and we had three. <laughs> three super studio events in a row. So it was great to be out there, but I want to, I think on a cube pod, I don't know, a few months ago, we were talking about how everybody was calling for Jassy's head, right? <laughs> Get rid of Andy Jassy. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's fumbling at him. Is it we like, are you kidding me? Yeah. This is the guy who built AWS. He conceived it, did the working back backwards document, trusted advisor to, to Bezos. And obviously knows what he's doing. So, Yes, a lot of it was cost cutting, but that's the thing about these big companies. They can dial down the costs and it drops right to the bottom line. The second thing is these CEOs are they're not dumb and they got good data. And so, okay, they were aggressive during the pandemic, hiring like crazy, but now they're like, "Hey, you know what? Let's let's set expectations that we know we can meet." Okay? In which I thought they were going to beat AWS by even more. I I they came in right at my number, which was two percentage points higher than what Wall Street was expecting for AWS. I thought they could have come in even higher. I think they're sandbagging for next quarter even, maybe tucking a little away, John, like you know, yeah. like, like we all used to do when we were managing budgets at big companies. <laughs> <laughs> well, the earnings, I mean, they didn't re actually give any guidance and kind of pissed off Wall Street apparently on the, on the earnings call. Uh, but I think there's definitely some sandbagging going on, to use your term. But you know, sandbagging basically means they want to set expectations. Because remember, the whole market will just flip upside down if they see any flinch of a negative trend. I think Amazon is a bellwether, and Andy Jassy at the helm, he's no stranger to that. I think he's probably more a little conservative than Bezos. Bezos is a freewheeler. He'd be like, okay, invest in the phone. There's a zillion projects. So Amazon has a history of experimentation. We know that. That's their culture. That's why they're so successful. You know what? Also, they're also successful at picking up on a wave that they missed and or a trend that their customers want and moving fast to get a product out there. So, you know, I, I've always said, you know, Jassy's going to tighten the ship, probably kill a bunch of projects that have no 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 hope at all, um, tighten up R&D. But really, it's all going to come down to, you know, how fast can customers get what they want? And they're much bigger now on AWS specifically around having enterprise. We talked about that last week. So, you know, Amazon always plays the long game. Um, and even though they had a little turnover in the staff, they still got, um, you know, younger executives coming up through the ranks that might not have been there during the growth years. So I think, you know, the combination of cost optimization and the AI wave, Amazon, I think got lucky with the AI wave. I know people could criticize, we've been critical of them, not moving fast enough on that hype, but this actually could be a godsend for them because the AI will lift up 
uh, this next generation of growth. So if Jassy's right that the right sizing and cost optimization is slowing down, which I think he's a little bit aggressive on that, I still think there's still more cost optimization going on. But the key thing, as we pointed out last week when we were in New York, is with Amazon Show was that investment that they're saving is being reinvested in AI. And that is a huge factor that people aren't paying attention to in the news is that that savings isn't just going in their pockets. They're reinvesting it. And the winners are doing that. The losers are just trying to stay alive. So, you know, you have the kind of walking dead companies and the ones who might not make it or make it, they're on the bubble. And then you have the ones that are already winning. They're just reinvesting. So those three categories are out there. You're seeing acquisitions. Hoppin, the famous uh, uh, event company that was worth billions of dollars, is basically dead now. Run the world, wait, Asian wait, Horowitz company. Wait, wait, don't, don't, don't leave Amazon yet. I want to, I want to make a comment if I can. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. The most interesting thing about the Amazon earnings call was how much time Jassy spent up front. You know, Jeff used to never even go in the calls. <laughs> he was just like. <laughs> Be in his yacht or whatever, whatever he's doing. You know, I'm, I'm kidding. But so, but Jassy, see, I think so. First of all, you know, but people forget that Amazon has always been the enterprise leader in AI with SageMaker and Tranium and Inferentia. I mean, they're way ahead of the game. They, they just got out marketed by Microsoft. I think Jassy was pissed. Like, yeah. because you saw the narrative. I, I remember reading, I think it was a Reuters article. It's like, you know, because Amazon, when they announced Bedrock and, you know, all the other, you know, capabilities, the the headline was like, oh, Amazon's AI announcements leave people wanting more. It's like, okay, yeah. Amazon's been a leader there and people misunderstood. Yeah. Amazon's behind in, in AI. They're behind in the marketing. So I think Jesse was pissed and he said, I'm going to spend some time here. He not only talked about Amazon retail, spent a yeah. lot of time layering, you know, laying out the three layers of, of 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 generative AI that they have from the foundation and and all the way up to the to the apps and their code whisperer blah blah blah, and so he really was emphasized that and I think as far as the optimization goes, here's what I think, here's what I'm thinking, and I think people forget, a lot of the optimization was getting people to sign up for multi year deals mm -hmm. and commit to a certain number of credits. And when you have those credits, you can dial them down, you can spend money, you can kick the can down the road. But ultimately over that term, you have to spend those credits. And so that that area under the curve is going to benefit Amazon in terms of revenue that 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 they have committed. Um and so I think what I think is going to happen is I think we've bottomed the deceleration of cloud growth. I get it flattish Next quarter, same around, you know, 12, 12 and a half percent. I think he could uptick in Q4 with a generative AI tailwind of as much as two points. So I, I'm projecting 14% growth in Q4. And I think, I think that's sort of, that's where the optimization, maybe there's a little bit left, but yeah. I think it's, it's worth the tail end of it. Well, your point about them being able to turn the knobs on Amazon and they have the data because they remember they have a lot of customers in their cloud so they can anonymize it and look at the holistic big picture trend and say, okay, here's what's, here's what's going on and then adjust accordingly. Uh, to your point about Jassy, um, we know Andy very well. Obviously, we interviewed him many times. He's one of those CEOs we we keep on the, on the direct dial as with other CEOs. Um, and you know, the key to Andy is, is that he likes to control the narrative. He likes to set the record straight, even from the beginning, when we started covering them, he always had this, um, perspective on the media where if they didn't get the story right, it would really bother him. Okay. And so that was because he wants, because it's a hard story to tell, even in the early days, mm -hmm. it's even more complicated now. And remember he wanted to be, a. Uh, a sports uh, announcer <laughs> remember that came out in his interviews you know he loves media he loves the he loves sports and other other things like that but the thing about jesse is, is that i think he was pissed and i would be pissed too because literally they were asleep at the switch on the pr side and missed the whole genera and let microsoft change the narrative on them um, which put them in a defensive posture which is is now clearly documented people are talking about but that's all people are talking about to your point they have been doing machine learning for a very very long time some companies have not been and are faking it till they make it amazon uh is going to be doing that so with jesse on the earnings call i think he likes those earnings calls because it's his opportunity to do kind of a keynote yeah and and set the record straight so i'm expecting more jesse um grabbing the microphone and going direct um, and I'm going to, I'm going to predict that you're going to see Jassy get in the weeds a little bit with Adam Selesky because they're, again, they've been partnered in the past, so they know each other well. 
I think they're going to actually look at the the Amazon AI story and product and solutions and nail it. You got Matt Garman who runs sales and marketing. Remember, he was the lieutenant who ran uh, EC2. He's not he's not a dummy. He knows he knows his stuff too. So they got advantages up and down the stack. The silicon layer you mentioned that, and so I think Amazon is perfectly positioned for the what the build out production workloads look like in generative AI. Yeah, sure, tell the whole world we're going to have AI everywhere. Okay, that's more posturing in my opinion but i think they will i mean that's natural but i think it's going to come down to who's building and deploying generative ai solutions and what that looks like and in his script he talked exactly what i we really we released with matt garman's story last month it's the data that matters move the ai to your data not the other way around and i think they are clearly focused on that value proposition and that's a bet dave I mean, they're betting the ranch on the fact that the large, large language models aren't a big deal. Okay, they're betting the the, the ranch that those large language models will be a big deal, and it, but but moving to data, not the other way around. So putting data into the large language models, that's not their play here, and that's clear. Well, this is where it gets interesting because the data, as we know, is everywhere. There's a lot of data in the cloud. I think there's way more than Jassy implies. I think it's more like. 40 to 50% of the data is in the cloud, <laughs> maybe not 50, but it's in the, you know, above 30% is in the cloud. So a lot of the, the AI is going to be done in the cloud, but that means there's a lot of data outside of the cloud at the near edge by near edge. I'm talking about like retail stores, uh, like a home Depot or something like that. And the far edge, like an autonomous vehicle and those autonomous vehicles, they need like instantaneous real time, no latency. And then you got, remember, we interviewed Matthew Prince at uh, SuperCloud 3. I thought what he was saying was really interesting. Hey, look, you're not going to train your models inside of Cloudflare, and Cloudflare is not going to run your your Tesla. But he goes, there's that sort of lowish latency. You don't want it in the cloud, but you want it at the edge of the network. He didn't use the term edge. He doesn't use that term. He prefers the term super cloud. But you get my point. That's where a company like Cloudflare, with a, there's going to be AI done in the network. So the and when you look at the survey data from ETR, it's like companies are saying we're going to do public, we're going to do private, we're going to do edge, and we're going to do a mix. It's kind of all of the above. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you got the numbers right on AWS, and uh, I think that's a great accomplishment to your research. I think you're the only one that got this right, and looking forward to seeing if you get the 14 percent growth we'll rate. And I think I think that if I'm Jassy, I'm saying I'll sandbag it too, because he wants to control the market. And, and again, Amazon's got to get back out in front. If you look at the numbers, okay, the, it depends whose numbers you look at. You know, they're at, a, at like a close to a ninety billion dollar runway, give or take a few billion here. Microsoft's in the sixties, right? So, and then Google's up there. So the big three are are not hurting right now. Google's making a charge. So that's a very interesting piece there. So it's not like it's not like the cloud growth rates. Um, are plummeting, although they are falling compared to their other norms of 80% on the high end. When you look at Azure's and, and Amazon, that's 40 going back to, to 2019. But the numbers are getting bigger, Dave. So you know the, the classic growth there. Now, the CapEx numbers being reported is Amazon's down 30% this quarter. That's not whether it's it's cloud CapEx or retail cutbacks, but Amazon uh, is reporting by uh, the, uh, the CapEx index, according to Charles Fitzgerald, our, our friend Fitzy. Amazon's to minus 30%, Google plus 1%, Microsoft up 23%. So Amazon spent 11.8 billion, Google 6.9, Microsoft 10.7. So Microsoft spending as much as AWS now are Amazon on their CapEx. But again, you go back, Amazon was pounding the CapEx for the last several years. When interest rates were low, Amazon was, they were going crazy. It's, it's so cost, I think that the cost of capital is free money. Yeah. Yeah, and that's. I think those. I think those. Those investments are going to pay dividends. And there's a there's an article in my dead tree here, the Wall Street Journal this week, um, uh, today actually. Data centers built for AI takeoff, and the point I mean touches upon what I was just saying, where it's not only going to be the public cloud buildouts, but the Equinix data centers and digital realty and other sort of regional data centers. Remember, they have they're they're they have tons of x86 servers and kind of older storage in there. And they need refresh, and you're going to see a ton of data center spend, and it's going to benefit NVIDIA, it's going to benefit AMD, it's going to it's going to benefit the infrastructure players, the server guys like HPE and Dell, 
uh, the storage guys. Uh, we had Vast uh, in, in studio this week. They're they're they've got some big visions. I know it's you know much smaller company, but they're trying to disrupt. And I, I think it's going to be a tide that lifts all ships that lean into AI. Well, I think I think the AI way is going to come. I think I think one of the things that we saw that uh, in this week was a big data week. We saw here uh, a bunch of stories that we posted. George uh, Gilbert had a, a, an emerging category. Um, what is a data platform? The discussion that we're putting out there. That's a killer post. You know, it's it's an emerging new category, right? Um, also, Vast Data had their big announcement in here in our studio, and then Rob Streche wrote, "What is a data product?" Okay, yep. so so what's interesting is, is that this week, the first time in in the history of of uh, the of this market trend, is that someone is actually using the term data developer. We've been saying it on the queue for a long time that this new rise of a data developer is coming. Mimi, some a coding developer coding in with data. Okay, so this data platform trend that and you started with the, your Uber post, your deep dive on their platform, is interesting. It's almost like platform engineering meets data. So. That's a, a interesting thing, and then you know more data management systems, more more land, uh, neon lands, forty six million in funding for serverless, pro, Postgres database, Monte Carlo debut is a new tool for monitoring, more and more stuff, and again with the Amazon stock, everything is up. Um, interesting market, Dave, right? Because you have you know three sets of companies: the Walking Dead, the ones on the bubble, and the ones that are winning with a tailwind. They're reinvesting in AI, so. It's interesting to see. You're seeing a lot of companies fall under. Obviously, the pandemic's killing the virtual events platforms. Hopin, the one story company. I think the founder did take a bunch of cash off the table, so he's pretty much rich. Uh, Hopin's dying or dead. Run the world in Adrian Horowitz is, is, is folded and sold to another company. Um, those pull forward COVID markets, as we pointed out, are not sustainable. So, you know, what's coming out of COVID is more digital, but less of the pure remote work kind of thing. So, you know, I, I think this whole wor uh, remote work is going to go back to normal. I think you're going to see hybrid for sure, but it's not going to be like everyone thought it would be. You're starting to see some 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 dead companies falling out of the sky as we predicted. So, you know, we'll, we'll see. I mean, you're either going to make it or not. And the, the bubble companies are the ones to watch. Do they actually have the room to pivot? Because there's really no excuse. You got the cloud, you got data, you can pivot into this market. Uh, if you if you can't, then that's going to be a structural issue. So uh, it's an interesting, interesting time, Dave. So, you know, I want to pick on something you said, you know, data as code. So cloud is code. Right? Amazon turned the data center into an API and programmable infrastructure became the norm. And now code is data. And what do you mean by, what do we mean by that? So you're increasingly coding by talking to systems. You know, human language is generating like a ton of code now. And that code, which is data, is now coming into it's data coming into organizations on what's happening in the supply chain, what's happening. This is where the Uber example comes in, people, places, and things, the digital representation of your business. That data comes in, it informs the state of your business, it predicts the future state of your business, and it's increasingly taking actions on your business, you know, with human involvement sometimes, quite often, but also increasingly without human involvement. So that's what, and you've been talking about this for years. I mean, I first heard you talk about this, you know, last decade, early yeah. last decade, actually, yeah. and it's and it's coming true. Yeah. Now, there's another article in the journal yesterday, after pandemic, work has less appeal. It's about, you know, young people basically saying, you know, I kind of don't want to go back to the office. And you got you know, executives who <laughs> work like dogs and, and the employees are saying, yeah, I don't kind of, I don't want to work that hard. You know, maybe, yeah. maybe money's not that important, but I think it's mixed. I think you have a portion of the young culture that grinds. And I think, you know, Silicon Valley, you know, represents that culture. And then I think you got other people who want more of a work-life balance. Uh, but I think, I, I think there's still a big section of yeah. the United States innovators that are working hard, they want to be collaborative. They're going to be in the office, and you know, I think yes, the work is hybrid. It'll be even some yeah, work but Dave, remote. Dave, but the thing is, the thing is, I mean, you know, think about like if you're in your twenties. Some companies, I mean, we're a little different. We're a medium. We are a lot of face to face. We do a lot of interaction with our, each other in our office and our teams. It, some companies, these people are just working remote. They're on Zooms all day. 
literally back to back to back zooms and and yeah. and webexes i mean that's got to be bad for your brain who can handle that um i mean that's just like it's hard i mean i just find that depressing uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know if it's going to sustain. Maybe I'm old school and the young guns can do it that way. But like, you know, I was talking with my daughter last night. She's up in the city. She works for UCSF and, you know, she works remotely and runs flexible. They're cool with it. So it's like, oh, no big deal. But they're on Zooms all the time. I mean, calendar, like, 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 you know, meeting after meeting after meeting, Zoom, 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 you know, video conferencing. It's got to get old. I mean, don't you, people want to see each other and have human interaction? I think that's going to be a big factor. It's a wild card, in totally. my opinion. I mean, think about it. If you're on Zoom, Zoom all day and you're at your home, okay, great. You can take some time off. You can walk the dog, take out the truck, whatever, whatever you're going to do. But you just can't replace the dynamic of walk, knocking on somebody's door or walking over to somebody's desk and saying, hey, you got a second? Yeah. You know, I, I want to show you something. Or hey, or just or just hanging out and meeting people. <laughs> it's like socializing, yeah, you know, socializing, shooting, right? Shooting the shit, as we say, right? You know, come on, what's going on? How's things going? You know, it's just better face to face, you know, just little things like that. I think I think people are going to go to the office for that, not for the meetings. Yeah, I'll do some zooms, and be productive. I get the productivity, but you know, there's got to be some sort of socialization, interaction. You know, talking about music, talk about what you did on the weekend, what you're going to do after work. You know, meet people. And you know, develop relationships. I think that's going to be huge for this next generation. And I'm not sure productivity. I mean, it was, certainly was up during the pandemic, um, but I'm not sure it's been sustained. Uh, I think you know a lot of people have side gigs. You know, we know that, right? So uh, they're working on their side gigs. You know, during the day. Uh, you know, during the during the pandemic, I think a lot of people worked nights and weekends, and I think that's sort of dialing down. A little bit, but I do think it's bifurcated. I think it depends on the individual. I see a lot of young people that really, they want to grind. They want to be, you know, in the mix. They got a lot of aspirations and, and money's important to them. And I see a lot of young people who say, you know what, I, I want a balance in life. Um, I don't want to grind. I don't really care that much about money. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> and Brendan, our producer is texting me. He's like, happy hour culture's up in the air too. Um, I think, I mean, I think it's like, you know, it's like we got to get back to the pre-pandemic where people were actually, you know, meeting people. Otherwise, people are going to go insane. I mean, if you're out there right now and you're working for a company, you got to, the companies have to be mindful of the, of the, of the video conference hell that if you're going to go back to back, you got to give people a break. So, you know, I think that's going to be the, the future of work conversation is not going to be about productivity. It's going to be about mental health and, and quality of life. Not just, you know, having the freedom to do stuff, but more of like, you know, what are people getting out of it? And I think there could be a backlash. You know, I'm all for virtual companies and all, and I think that's great, but I think there's, a, there's an element for that. I think that might be the big thing. But anyway. Um, I think, too, I think the last thing, too, is say people, that for the rant people, section. People want flexible time. You know, they they do. And I think happy employees you know, stay longer. So, and, and less turnover is, is better for companies in general. So, Right. So, Dave, some big news also happening. Enterprise moves. Um, New Relic got bought out by Francisco Partners for six point five billion. Private equity company. Um, Sumo Logic was already acquired. Um, by so they're them. bringing those two assets together, right? Sumo Logic and New Relic. This sort yep. of adjacencies. Um, yeah, okay. and, and, and yeah, and that, and and yeah. Well, everyone's crowded gonna, market. Everyone's like prices market. are going to go up. <laughs> <laughs> well, so yeah, exactly. So New Relic, remember, New Relic built a purpose-built database to do application performance management, aka now they call it observability. The observability market gets really, really crowded. You get new guys coming in like Datadog and Elastic. You know, Splunk's doing a big pivot, and so you know it's hard for a company like New Relic, which was once you know the bell of the ball, and then all of a sudden you got all these other you know companies coming in. They had you know, sort of an expensive infrastructure living off the install base. And you're right. Now they bring it in, they make some cuts, they try to find some synergies, prices go up a little bit, and they just, you know, drive cash flow. That's yeah, kind and of so, some other some other moves in the enterprise, obviously, um, Rohit Prasad leading their AI team at Amazon, Dell C co-CEO, co-COO, co Chuck Witten leaving the company. Um, that's... An interesting move. Cube alumni. He's been with Del, Michael Dell for almost Forever. two dec almost two decades. He was at Bain, came in. Um, interesting take on that a move. I didn't see that coming. Maybe it was a, a redundant position or it didn't work out. I don't know what the thing is. He, I thought he was a very strong executive. 
Um, and Cloudera has a new CEO. Um, Yawn, I guess, you know, on that one. But Cloudera has kind of kind of been invisible lately, Dave. You know, they're not really making any noise. Um, I haven't really heard of much going on, but since Databricks has been so successful, it's not almost like Cloudera is in the shadows. So, yeah, Cloudera, so. Cloudera, you know, we know what happened with Cloudera, right? They, they, they have no Cloudera. They have a, the only cloud they had was in the name. And then what happened was they had to spend so much money, you know, supporting open source projects and then things would change so quickly. And then Spark came and basically took over Hadoop. And then you had Hortonworks and Cloudera emerged. They had two separate, you know, roadmaps. They killed both individual roadmaps and they created a new roadmap. And that just caused more customer confusion, you know, but they went private equity and, you know, so they got, they got bought. I mean, they got it all started to the yeah. credit and some of the best minds, you know, started that company. Guys like Jeff Hammerbacher, Amar Awadala. You know, yeah. We've had them on the cube many times. I mean, they, they were the original you know, early thinkers, thought leaders in, mm -hmm. in so-called big data and um, really it, 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 it made a huge contribution to the industry. It's just unfortunate that it couldn't be, you know, sustained. It's interesting. Big data, they were the pioneers. And we were talking to Armagon, who's a new CEO of AppPen Pen now. We just on a call with them and his team, yeah. which are powering a lot of LLMs. We talk about the old oh, a bunch of EMC guys getting together. But remember, Jeremy Burton had the positioning of cloud meets big data. And was kind of the, the street signs, you know, and Steve Jobs had, you know, social science, computer science. No, that's our, our tech line. Uh, liberal arts and, and technology. Um, we were computer science and social science, you know, the street signs. That was ahead of his time. That was in 2011, Dave. Jeremy Burton had big data meets cloud. It's here now. Over 12 years later, big data meets cloud is here. And if you look at the generative AI and what we're doing with super cloud, the narrative around super cloud, by the way, SuperCloud 4 is coming up in October. Mark your calendars. Last week of October, doing SuperCloud 4. It's all about AI, uh, generative AI. The generative AI movement is all about because of cloud. And the generative AI momentum around open source is all about cloud. Cloud has fueled a massive surge in software development, open source, SaaS, and now SuperCloud building a platform on top of clouds and then cross-connecting the clouds. So... If you, that is a huge power dynamic right now. And I think if you look at the generative AI te technology wave, I, I predict it's going to be a few more months to people just building out and there'll be a breakout period quickly where you're going to start to see new things emerge, new companies, not just of the fancy and and um, hyped up LLMs from the open AIs of the world. But I think you're going to see some really interesting new things that no one's seen before that pop out, um, new use cases. Because the value at scale has never been realized or seen before of data. So like the data business of big data is finally here. It's Databricks and Snowflake and MongoDB, you know, and a bunch yeah. of other companies that are filling in big white spaces that, that are going to take territory while the clouds will reap all the benefits. So, you know, Amazon, Azure, and Google Cloud will re reap the rewards. I mean, this is a party of epic proportions from a business perspective. Think about the growth. I mean, I think this is going to be a surge of growth uh, that that'll hit all parts of the ecosystem, not just one category. That's why I say there's the, there's the walking dead who will never make it. They're not compatible with the new model. The people on the bubble will either pivot to the new next gen cloud model with generative AI or the ones that are already in position to just get into that slipstream and ride that wave and and cap capture that, that that major growth wind coming up. It's, it's going to be interesting. So. I, I, and the signs are all coming in there. Look at we, we reported on SiliconANGLE ARM could go public uh, in September at a sixty billion dollar valuation. Obviously, processors. You see Amazon's growth in processors and Graviton uh, chips. Andy Jassy said they have fifty thousand people who have moved, moved workloads to Graviton just during their resizing. So, okay, Apple still doing extremely well. Just the new surge is here. Yeah. Well. It's interesting. Actually, Apple was way down today um, because, you know, it's like the third quarter in a row, they didn't grow. But Except China, they grew almost 8% year over year to $15 billion in China. But I think... I, it, I, it, iPhones it, but, up double digits. But I think it's it's in China. Yeah, but I think it's... the But what people seem to be missing is that the install base is such that they, services grew like nicely. And so... 
I mean, Apple's not my wheelhouse, but I, I mean, when you have that much of an install base and you have that many services that people can just tap, you know, and with your Apple Pay, that's <laughs> that is to me a buying opportunity. That's why. Yeah. That's why the whole their whole announcement with the whole glasses and the metaverse thing was such a bummer because it was as if they had nothing else to do, so they had to throw something over the transom. Um, and and waiting for the the lull between iPhone launches and then ultimately how do they milk their services? So like AWS, Amazon's I mean like AWS and Amazon, Apple's got a lot of knobs to turn too. Dave, yeah, they totally. have huge workflow extensions into their marketplace. So iPhone, new iPhones coming out, so they manage the inventory turns there. But they're making money ten ways from Sunday on everything else. They are platform now. Services are growing. So yeah, I think they're just like bunkering down, saying, "Hey, we're not going to make a lot of cash. Let's let's get these other areas up and running, um, like services." And and the China thing puzzles me. I don't really understand that market, but it is Reuters is reporting that they're up. Um, to 15 billion. So uh, interesting that they're up there, but down overall in the quarter, uh, 1.4% to 81 billion. So 81 billion. So big numbers. <laughs> it's like crazy. It's in unbelievable. Yeah, just, just a fun time, Dave. I mean, I got to say, we did three weeks in a row of in studio live events in Palo Alto. I was in New York last week for AWS Summit in New York. Met with a lot of customers over there, some practitioners on financial services um, and other verticals. Um, we talked a lot about the repatriation or the refactoring and investment in AI, but yeah, just yeah, and a lot of other stuff too. Donald Trump's back on the radar with his politics. He's got indicted and he's running for president. He's got the lead by like 50 something percent of Republican votes. You know, can you imagine a president elect running That's for unbelievable. president in jail? It's, and, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's just, just come on, it's just a bipartisan. It's, I said it on one of the Q pods, and I get you know where I stand on Trump. I'm, I'm definitely not a fan, yeah. but I, I, I wish, I, I wish Joe Biden would just pardon him and end it. <laughs> I mean, I, when I say that, to, <laughs> no, no, you should pardon him and say, don't run for president. I'll pardon you. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Quid pro quo. I will pardon you if you just like step aside. Of course, Trump wouldn't do it. But it's just like, it's got to stop all this bipartisan. Somebody's got to come out in 2024 that has just some sense of uh, just down the middle. <laughs> some sense of, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's well, like, you know, it would be great if both Biden and Trump didn't run. Well, yeah. And so somebody's got to come out. So that happens. If there's just somebody who has, is fiscally responsible and socially empathic and has a message around that, I think they'll, the, the the electoral will pay attention to it. It's just that they're so entrenched in each party. It's just it's just so annoying. I'm so sick of it. Um, what's, your rant gonna, what's your rant going to be this week? My rant? Yeah, what's your rant going to be this week? I know. Lena Khan was kind of not really prominent this week. Here's my rant. I, I'll give you my rant. So I was talking last night to Bob O'Donnell, Okay. And he's coming out uh, east this week, so I'll probably see him at a Sox game. Uh, and he spent his own time, his own money. He did like, I want to say, a thousand user survey on Gen AI. It was. I don't believe it was sponsored. I don't think it was. So it's not sponsored content. He just did it. So it's independent, completely independent. And he put it out there. He put it up on his website and for all to see. No gate, no paywall, no bullshitty, give me your email, your phone number, your home address, your kids' names, all your PII, none of that. For so, free. I love that. For free. I love that. And so he's basically giving to me, back to the audience, Bob's a very successful guy. He was at IDC. You know, he and I both worked at IDC. We didn't really work that closely together, but he was, you know, what, ha what happens is the top analysts, like the, the really... The best analysts at these firms, they leave the firms mm -hmm. and then they come on and they do really well and they make a million bucks a year. I mean, they, you know, the best analysts can do that. And he was one of them. And I don't know how much he makes. I'm just sort of making up that number, yeah. but he does very well. He's extremely successful. And so, but, but, but what he's doing still, despite his success, he's giving back to the audience. He's giving more than he's taking. And I love that. And so I really uh, applaud him. I've just seen, you know, so many times that you've got to put in your 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 data just to read something and then when you read that something you're like oh 
I just gave up my data for that. It was crap. It wasn't real research. It was just a bunch of bromide, some bullshitty analyst opinion, or maybe it was some pay to play nonsense. And so that's why I always resisted doing anything with breaking analysis. That's not open and free. I don't want any sponsorships or any, you know, that, that, that nonsense. I just, yeah. you know, so, so good for Bob O'Donnell at yeah. technalysis going to tech, go to technalysis.com or I think that's his website and it's just free. It's a gen AI, a thousand users. And he summarized that it. it's all out there for everybody yeah. to see. Awesome well, job. Well, you know me about my rant on this is that, you know, I've said it before in the pod, you know, events company, the events teams are, are, trying to gouge the cash out of the out of the users rather than the companies the analyst market we seeing analysts out there um basically faking influence by saying that they are doing research and they are research analysts but that don't do it that doesn't do any research yeah. right so so like to me if you got work put it out there for the world to see if you don't then you're just talking, right? So people talk. And the problem I have with some of these these um, other analysts is that what they do is they take research like Bob's and they turn it into like their original content. So it's not their original content. So there is not yet an attribution like Creative Commons in the analyst community. I think it's going to come. I think it's going to be one of these things because you have to share, right? We're in a market where there's two analysts. There's open, share, uh, publicly share your original content and ones that are going to do deep research, hold it back and make money from the for the access. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's a model. Um, so there's either one or the other, but for the folks yeah. in between running around saying, I'm an analyst, they don't do any research. Um, uh, that's, that's, that's probably, no, uh, you know, you're right. I mean, look, look at Gartner and IDC, they put a lot of money and time and they built it up over, over years and years and years and it's expensive and they charge for it. I, I get that. Um, but I want to, I want to shout out to somebody else. Dion Hinchcliffe a few weeks ago, maybe two weeks ago, put out a framework for understanding to helping customers understand where, how to make decisions around where to put specific workloads, you know, cloud or on-prem, what the characteristics are, some different industry considerations. Again, free research. Put it out on Twitter. Click this link. There it is. I actually used uh, his his data in his report in one of my breaking analysis. It was I thought so so well done. And so again, uh, uh, you know, Constellation does some good work. Holger Muller. Uh, Andy Turai, obviously Ray Wong is a uh, you know, sharp analyst. So I just, I appreciate birds of a feather like us that put that free content out yeah. there and, and serve the audience first and, and, and make money at the back end. Good well, job. I, think, I mean, I think, I think at the end of the day, all media, whether it's analysts, influence, journalism, it's a service business, right? So you serve audiences and you serve the marketers. That's how media gets works. Um, however, in, in the analyst business, if you, you got to service the customer, <laughs> so you can't service the customer if you're running around, you know, saying great things about companies, but doing no research. So to me, I think that's, that's, a, that's going to be, um, a 2024 issue for the, um, for the analyst relations departments to figure out like, okay, you know, okay, Gartner, IDC, and the big guys go in there, but then you start thinking about well, there's a real influencers out there that, are, that have expertise and and they need to be identified and, and rewarded for that. So I think that's going to be a big thing we're going to see, Dave, uh, the re reputation um, quality, right? Um, not just, you know, how many briefings you do or how many videos you do or, you know, just doesn't have, that's the impact and the reputation over time, as we know, you know, 13 years doing the cube and Silicon angle, we've never charged for content and we want to make it free. So I like the Bob O'Donnell model. And I think that's a long game approach rather than a short, fake it till you make it approach. And, you know, the super cloud is a great example. Another way, great example that the industry leaders coming together on the verge of on the, on the week before black hat, we have so much content at super cloud four was security conference. We had the CEOs of the best companies on talking about security. Well, guess what? Next week, black hats there. And that content's out there. I was talking to someone last, uh, last week. Uh, and then earlier this week to saying, Hey, you know, I've been re watching all the videos on, on super cloud four to prep for, for black hat in Vegas. Again, it's all free. I think, I think open source is coming to content and, uh, in a big way. In the next uh, 24 months or so, you're going to start to see some change over, uh, and it's going to impact how companies engage with their customers. So, um, yeah, I'm excited by that. And that's that's you my know, rant. My rant is the confusion between what's real and what's not, and I think ultimately this, th there needs to be some new metrics around that. I think too. Um, you know, doing cube interviews, we we invite all the analysts. We 
we've had analysts from every firm on Gartner, IDC, Forrester, ESG, name an analyst firm. You know, almost all of them have been on. And if they haven't been on, it's just because it's just been bad luck. I mean, we, we, we don't really try to block anybody. Zias Caravala is another one. But you, my point is, you can tell who's got the analyst chops when you have them on, right? <laughs> but I'll tell you, a lot of these guys, I love having IDC and Gartner analysts on because they're good. You know, and so for us, it's like your point about we've always believed in open source. That's what we started. Wikibon was open source research. And yeah. so you know, way back when the day, I remember my wife, Deb, asked me, how are you going to make money? I said, I, I don't know. We'll figure it out. And, yeah. and the cube is a research machine. You're breaking analysis yes. is amazing. But again, research is going to have a production system that's going to involve crowd, crowd intelligence. Wisdom of the crowd will be a factor. Uh, but again, back to my thing is, is that are you doing, if you're a research analyst, the question is, are you doing any research? And the body of work is important, not just flying around, attending, collecting retainers um, that a lot of people do. They don't do any, you got to do the research, you got to do the service. The service is develop research for the audience and help companies with their with their objectives. So well, what about that's, disclosures? That's what about disclosures, John? Because, you know, I, and this this is one of the things that Rob Hof has brought to, to Silicon Angle is when we do a cube gig, we have to, just anything we write, we we, we, I guess we don't have to, but we do. We disclose that this company is paying us to be here. Now, you know, we don't, we don't yeah. pee right. where we eat. So when the CEO of the company comes on, you know, we'll ask some tough questions. We don't necessarily, we're not like attack dogs with the tone. But when we're doing the analyst roundtable, even last week at Vast, had all the Vast guys sitting in the studio, and we had you, me, Sanjeev, and uh, Rob Stretche, and we were like, yeah, this is the good, the bad, the unknown, the ugly. And you know those guys were sitting right there, um, but again, anything we write, we we disclose. I think a lot of times it's not clear. You know, IDC, for instance, discloses. That's something that we, when I was there, we resolved years and years ago. And so, but sometimes it's fuzzy. It's like, hmm, was this paid for or not? Some people disclose it, some people don't. You know, the analyst is a pay-to-play business. You know, for the most part, people got to eat. I get that, but you know, I think you know, disclosure is is critical. Well, I mean, look at the, the end of the day. You get yeah, the 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 research analysts are there to provide a service to to audiences and marketers and custom companies, right? So you're really a partner um, to the industry. It's it's an industry game, and and you know the ultimate compliment is when someone says you're an important partner to the to the industry, and that you know people appreciate the work and they appreciate the content you create. Um, and that's ultimately the test. You know, that's that's a direct quote from Andy Jassy about some of the work we've done. So, you know, when you're a part, when you're part of the industry and you're helping people, right? It's, it's it's good. And also, if you're also gouging customers and not delivering what you say you're going to deliver, you know, that's a problem. And consistently, that's 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 you know, I mean, people make mistakes here and there, but for the most part, if you're out there and, and you're just not delivering, okay, on the promise. And you don't have the value. You're just stealing from the customer. Or if you're double charging or triple charging them, um, I've seen that instance all the time. So there's there's, there's that there's a there's some bad behavior going on. It's got to be rectified. So that's my rant. Um, and uh, back back to our programming, um, real time. So we got big events coming up. I want to get your thoughts on this because you know the big one that I'm watching closely is um, the VMware Explore. Um, it, this could be. The, the last uh, event for VMware as an independent company, um, I'm even thinking that Broadcom could make moves at in Vegas, certainly before um, Barcelona, VMware Barcelona, of which Hock Tan and the Broadcom executives said they would have the, the exit and close before their fiscal year, which I think ends at the end of October. So, um, and I was hoping the club would close before VMware Explorer later on this month, but it's getting getting close, isn't it? Um, so that, that's that's a big event, Dave. VMware, really kind of interesting position there on the eve of the being swallowed up by Broadcom, which everyone's speculating on the moves they're going to make. Are they going to gut VMware, or will they keep it? The way it is. Well, you, you, you and know, I both have said. <laughs> I mean, you saw. I go back to my post the day they announced it, and I was pretty, you know, vocal about what I thought they were going to do. I do think that 
based on just reading what Hawk Tan has written and talking to people that, you know, that thinking has evolved, but I still think a lot of that is still, still true. A lot of what, what I wrote way back when yeah. I, I think that I do think that he believes in, in cross cloud services, AKA multi-cloud or super cloud. And I think that bodes well for Tanzu. Yeah. Um, I, I, I also haven't heard anything about project Monterey in forever, right? That was something that even, you know, last year they were talking about and, that seems to have have died. I hope it's not because that's how they, that's how VMware. So one of the the premise of VMware getting through the sort of FTC knothole is that that creates competition for the public clouds. And by the way, I believe that VMware Cloud Foundation, even VMware Cloud on AWS, is complementary slash, you know, quasi competitive to some of the other public clouds. Obviously, AWS benefits, but but on prem clouds are a legitimate contender. And so if if the if VMware doesn't have Project Monterey, how are they going to keep pace with Nitron and Graviton and Tranium and Inferentia? We know that Google is doing what Amazon has done. They're copying those moves. We know the same thing is true with with Microsoft. How are the on-prem guys going to compete? They're all, they've been relying on VMware to provide yeah. that platform. So that's something that I, I, I'll be I'll be looking for at VMware. Well, I, I I am I've said well, for, we predicted that they're going to gut sales and marketing. So I think clearly VMware is at risk on the marketing side. So if you're Broadcom's very much um, straight up about this, they're going to make efficiencies work. The question is, do they take the strategic crown jewel of this kind of next chapter with microservices and containers? Because Virtual machines are going to move into that new world. The VMs won't go away completely, but you're going to see that trend. So, I, yeah, look, they will gut sales and marketing. Um, the question is, does the CMO move over or does the Broadcom CMO stay? That's going to be very interesting to say. That's going to be a tell sign. And there's, there's, what is, happens to Ragu? Is he going to be jettisoned too? We don't know. All I know is this. The user base for VMware is huge. And that user base has been relevant for decades. Okay, for the past 15 years, if you are a VMware user, a VMUG member or a customer, you are basically running some cool stuff in IT. You are you are doing great. There's an extinction factor going on in the VMware ecosystem with respect to the professionals. And we saw that with our SuperCloud 3 event where we got over a thousand nominations from the VMware ecosystem practitioners who wanted to do talks. Uh, for when we put nominated speaker, we had fifth, over 1,500, Dave, over 1,000, close to 1,500 VMware ecosystem participants. That re means that SuperCloud is resonating with the professional that's looking at their next career. And we talked about it in SuperCloud 3, and that is, is that that IT person will be running IT at scale. And Vittorio Villaringo mentioned this on his uh, LinkedIn post, which is going viral right now, which is the, the future of IT is going to be to rein in that chaos and complexity that's come from the sprawl of the new next-gen cloud. That's the IT department now. The IT department is like the old IT department, except they're pushing different buttons and turning different knobs. And I think that is what SuperCloud is appealing to people because it's not just Amazon certification or knowing AWS or knowing Azure or Google, you got to know everything. So in the department of an IT department of the future, the, f the former VMware world, that's the perfect career landing spot. Managing the multiple vendors, multiple technologies, multiple data sources, multiple security paradigms and postures inside a company. This is going to be a revolution in the position. And it's going to be something that's that's already, we already got badges pr uh, printed out for SuperCloud. So SuperCloud is a career path now. I think that's going to be very interesting to see because VMs aren't going away. They never will. But they'll combine with microservices, containers, Kubernetes, cloud native applications that are all going to be part of this next fabric of generative AI and new data sources, data platforms. So this is here. I mean, this is this is now a declaration of a new paradigm. Yeah. And, and you know, remember the early days of VMware when something went wrong, like it was like you'd have to bring in guys with lab coats to figure out what was going on, right? <laughs> I mean, and, and then through all the various APIs and the VASs and the storage integration and all that stuff. I mean, VMware did a really good job of working with the industry and the ecosystem to 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 clean that up and, and simplify it. 
you're seeing you know similar complexity now with with cloud and cross cloud and who better than the vmware practitioners to address that um and to sort of identify the gaps help the technology industry fill those gaps you know identify sort of the api integration that's needed maybe new new startups i mean there's a real opportunity to your point about career paths or i guess vittorio point the original point um it's a, a a great career path for people yeah. um to go beyond you know vmware admin right Check out SuperCloud World. It's our website, supercloud.world. We may pick that URL because it sounded like a, a cool cool name to have for a virtual event and ultimately an event for the industry, uh, independent event. Check it out. Great names up there. And Security Plus AI was a great episode. That's going to be great videos. If you're going to Black Hat and you listen to this uh, in Vegas, so some good videos from CEOs, the leading companies from Zscaler, CrowdStrike, you name it, all the best companies were in there. Um, the other event I'm looking forward to, Dave, is uh, Google Next. Google Next is having an event. They took the Moscone slot from VMware. VMware is moving to Vegas for VMware Explorer, formerly VMworld. But Google's cloud is doing well. There was just announced, I saw Amit Zavery and uh, Bruno uh, Azia, who is now at Google Capital. Bruno, there's two mentions in a row, week to week. Um, if you're listening, good shout out. But Amit Zavery was talking about they're getting all the gen AI workloads on Google. Their earnings growth came in at 28%, which is the same as Q1. But their annual recurring revenue is up, okay, up to the levels where the high watermark about two point three billion, um, and so there's a potential, you know, opportunity with Google with AI. And again, we've always said that Google had a nice developer cloud model going on, and they seem to like slipped a little bit on that. But AI could be a renaissance for them with this. So I, I think I'm going to watch that very closely. Uh, the Cube will be at Google Next this year. They're back at the physical events, um, and it's going to be sold out. I think it's going to be packed. And so that's going to be interesting to see. I think Google's clearly in the game. I used to be very critical of Google. Like, well, way there, way back. Not anymore. <laughs> well, <laughs> Google Next Google Next is always a good show. There's always a lot of innovation. But I think I'm going to tap out, John. I, I didn't get the invite to the analyst event. Evidently, it's oversold. But, you know, I don't know. I mean, they they must have not seen my Uber post. I mean, and, um, but I, because I write about Google a lot, but I guess I yeah. just out of sight, out of mind, I really haven't worked it, but I think I'm going to, I think I'm well, going to tap I, out. I think, I think, I think you might've been invited. I think they probably just, you know, they thought you were, I don't know. Maybe folks. I, maybe I missed the email. I don't know. It happens sometimes. I do. I well, you're going travel. on vacation anyway that week. So well, I'm not, I wouldn't say vacation. I am going to probably go to Saratoga <laughs> for a couple have you of ever, days. Have you ever taken a vacation? <laughs> I know, right? No, yes, but I always work during the vacation. No, but I think that's I, not a vacation. I think, I think I'm going to tap out and go to Saratoga for a night or two that week, but I'll be watching remotely. Yeah. So well, good luck on your races. All right. Well, Dave, this, uh, um, we did our rant. Any other final thoughts for this week? I mean, it's been kind of crazy. I'm kind of burnt out. This, uh, it was a great run in uh, June and July. Um, I think, well, so SuperCloud was great. We had three events in a row, SuperCloud, and then we had the Super Studio events with IBM and Vast. I was impressed with the IBM content. I mean, I'm not say saying that because they sponsored us. I mean, I think that what was missing was some new announcements, but they actually dusted off a lot of the stuff that they had, like Watson X, which I sort of underappreciated. I had a great conversation with Vincent with Vincent Shu about what they had and and Andy Walls about some of the stuff they're doing, uh, looking for anomalies in data <clears throat> that can can help with malware and doing some cool detection. So IBM's finally applying its AI in a practical way instead of trying to solve cancer. Uh, they're doing things that are practical. So I was kind of happy about that. And then the vast data was mind bending. I think, yeah. you know, so, so I guess the, the, I close with this, the future of data management is going to be about building data apps that represent yeah. the real world, people, places, and things. And you got, you got companies like Snowflake coming at it from the world of database, you know, the historical, you know, ground of Oracle, you got the data science crew coming in. You know, we're talking about companies like Databricks, and you should have storage companies because that's where all the data is, is on storage. <laughs> yeah. But really, you know, Dell's not doing it. You know, NetApp's not doing it. HPE is really not doing it. IBM, we talked about a little bit, but yeah. Vast Data has this giant vision 
to really be a data platform, which is unique coming at it from a storage angle. So they're all converging on this yeah. future of data platforms, which George and Rob Strecce just wrote about. Yeah, and, and by the way, MongoDB, similar approach, and their stock's at over 400 and growing. They got a bump with the Amazon news. I totally agree. I think the this data movement, data developers, the rise of the data developer, data applications, super apps, super cloud, super computing, super computing, super cloud, and super apps. This, this, this kind of... It's interesting. We've been hearing people on the cube talk about the OSI model, um, open systems interconnect with the standards model back in the '80s that created the, the computer industry that that it is today. It's well, well known, very historic moment in time. It's been re- that's been referenced. Not only really, we reference it once in a while, but it's been referenced mm. multiple times. And so you have this uh, focus now, industry focus around the three layers of the cake: physical layer abstraction layer which is middleware oversimplifying it and then the top of the stack which is applications in the context of cloud computing going next generation meaning more performance more services built in more ways to build applications so you have more higher level services more physical capability and performance with chips and and hardware and now more abstraction layers in this middle layer happening at scale. So it's not like just a simple mid saying, oh, it's middleware. That was an easy thing to say back in the 80s and 90s. No, it's you get hardware and you get software, middleware, and then the applications. It's complicated. You have an operating system basically happening at the at the cloud. The cloud is a uh, creating a distributed computing paradigm at global scale that looks more like an operating system that can be tailored to anything to anyone to any app if Mm. harnessed properly so i think we're entering an era where this data wave is pointing out the fact that if you code and architect something properly or architect and code something properly you can create great value and i think the value is the scale and no one's ever seen that yet because we've never had the level of scale that we have today in the industry. So I think the VCs and all the industry participants and pundits um, can talk about stuff, but they don't understand what's happening because they've never seen it before. So there's no historical reference other than metaphors and, and, and mental models around what happened to figure out what's happening. So I think we are living in an age of, of scale and data that is going to set up an entrepreneurial surge that's going to be massive. Great opportunities to create. And I'm glad you mentioned that. So we use Mongo because it's developer friendly and it's and it's simple. We use it for the Cube AI. Uh, you actually go to the thecubeai.com. We use Milvis, which is a vector database, which is a competitor of Pinecone. We have actually real AI. A lot of people say, oh, we got AI, but we have real AI. <laughs> go to thecubeai.com and sign up for the private beta and you'll see it. You know, it's still not perfect, but it's, it's very cool. It's you very can good. you can it can ask it a question. It gives you an answer, and it gives you related clips. And if the clips aren't there, we have the capability to auto make clips now, which is an amazing capability, like instantaneous. It's it's very cool and it's real, not like some of the pretenders that we've we've seen out there. We're not AI washing, but uh, so yeah, check that out. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, yeah, the Cube AI. We also got the video video uh, first. Uh, video plus AI, uh, video data lake going on. We had a lot of fun. Again, media is data, and we're having a good time. Go check out the Cube AI. Go to siliconangle.com. That's where all the content is. That's where we put all of our videos. That's where we stream our content. The cube.net is our catalog. Go check it out there. That's where the Cube Alumni database is. Check that out. Of course, uh, you know if you like this podcast, let us know. Share it with a friend. Um, we're on episode 23 and getting in the 20s now, and we're getting some, you know, some good network effect, Dave, some word of mouth getting around. So if you're listening, drop us a note. Um, happy to hear from you. And if you have any ideas on uh, uh, what we what we should riff on, let us know. Starting yeah. to grow, <laughs> starting to grow, John. I mean, you look at breaking analysis now is over 15,000, 16,000 a week. And I went back and I looked at the early days of breaking analysis. You know, the first, I don't know, 70 episodes were, you know, yeah. kind of similar as to we, we, where we are now. We're getting some you know, downloads are growing. And so please check it out. And it's thecubeai.com. Check that out. It's yeah. it's a weird kind of URL for, <laughs> but but I All want right. you to, we want your feedback. So let us know what you think. Well, thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.